Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the Fund for American Studies Journalism Awards Dinner. We have an outstanding program in store for you tonight, and I'm only sorry that not all of you can join us here in person. We very much look forward to seeing you in person again next year once the coronavirus crisis is passed. But I think you'll find that this innovative interactive program we have tonight is a wonderful substitute for that person-to-person -person interaction. Tonight's program will last for about an hour and will include many components that are both live, streamed over the internet, and pre-recorded. My name is Daniel McCarthy. I'm the director of the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program, also the director of the Joseph Rago Memorial Fellowship for Excellence in Journalism. Tonight's program will include uh, remarks by all of our six new Robert Novak Journalism Fellows. It will also include the awarding of the Thomas L. Phillips Career Achievement Award to Maria Bartiromo. Subsequently, we will hear from Paul Rago, the father of Joseph Rago, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and editorial page writer for the Wall Street Journal. Unfortunately, Joseph Rago died at a tragically young age, and so we have established a fellowship in his memory and to continue his legacy. We will hear from the new recipient of the Joseph Rago Memorial Fellowship, Alessandra Boki, later in the evening as well. Following her will come Paul Jigot, the editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal. He too is a Pulitzer Prize winner. Wrapping up the evening, we will hear from Fund for American Studies President Roger Ream, and subsequently we will have a very innovative uh, program of breakout sessions taking place over Zoom where viewers at home will get to interact with our new Novak Fellows and the new Joseph Rago Memorial Fellow. The Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program began over a quarter century ago. It was really one man's tremendous vision that made it happen. That man was Thomas Phillips. He had been a very successful businessman who made a fortune through the newsletter industry. And he wanted to give something back to journalism. So he asked his friend, Robert Novak, what he could do that would be most effective. And Robert Novak, who of course was a legendary journalist, a syndicated columnist, the host of CNN's Crossfire, and a, a man known as the Prince of Darkness uh, by his critics, and by many of his friends as well. Novak suggested to Thomas Phillips that he start this fellowship program, which has subsequently come to be named after uh, Robert Novak. And at the beginning, Thomas Phillips and Robert Novak recruited John Farley to help as the executive director of the program. And for most of the past quarter century, John Farley was its director and was really its heart and soul. He was someone who inspired all of the young journalists who came through the program and owned their talents uh, through his mentorship. Tragically, we lost John Farley earlier this year. And so as a result, we have now renamed what had been called the Alumni Fund Fellowship. We've renamed it in honor of John Farley. It's now the John Farley Alumni Fund Memorial Fellowship. We have with us tonight uh, the young man who will be the first recipient of that fellowship, Charles McElwee. He's among the six outstanding young journalists who are the new Robert Novak Journalism Fellows. And in just a moment, I will bring them on stage. But let me give you an overview right fast of who they are, where they come to us from, and what their projects are. We will hear from Christian Britschke, who is an associate editor at Reason Magazine, and his project is Coronavirus and Leviathan. Charles McElwee, who is our first John Farley Memorial uh, Alumni Fund Fellow, comes to us from the Commonwealth Foundation in Pennsylvania, and his project, which is very timely, is called Pennsylvania, a Microcosm of America's Political Realignment. Following him, we will hear from Julia Yost, a senior editor at First Things. Her project is The New Normlessness, Scandal in a Time of Uncertainty. After her will come Dmitry Symes, who is a freelance journalist who will be joining us from Moscow, Russia, and his project is The Grand Coalition, Russia and China Against the United States. Following him, there will be Tara Isabella Burton. She is a freelance journalist who has written a book called Strange Rights, New Religion in a, for a Godless World. And her project is Miniature Gods, Why We Cannot Create Ourselves and Why We Keep Trying Anyway. She'll be looking at the ways in which people create new digital identities for themselves. And last but far from least is Lyman Stone. He is an independent data journalist. His Novak project is As Many As I Want, Restoring Individual Preferences to Population Policymaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so delighted to be hosting you tonight, and uh, I'm happy to welcome the first of our Robert Novak Journalism Fellows for this year, Christian Britschke, onto the stage. Uh, 
Uh, hi, how's it going? My name is Christian Britschke. Uh, I'm an associate editor at uh, Reason Magazine, as Dan mentioned. Uh, my project is called Crisis and Leviathan. Um, anyone who's familiar with uh, Robert Higgs will probably recognize, or sorry, it's called uh, Coronavirus and Leviathan. Anyone who's familiar with uh, the economic historian Robert Higgs will probably notice it owes an intellectual debt to uh, Higgs's book Crisis and Leviathan. Um, in that book, Higgs talked about how the growth and the power of the American state over the 20th century um, was a result of several acute crises, two world wars, and one economic uh, depression that saw government during those crises massively expand its power. And then after that crisis was over, it would um, some of the power would recede, but it would never fully the government would never fully relinquish it, creating this ratchet effect. Um, through a series of reported features, um, my Novak Fellowship project is going to probe the same ways that this current pandemic is also leading to a massive expansion in the growth of the American state. Um, I think we can all think of a few examples of that already, whether it's business closures, whether it's uh, mask mandates, whether it's the massive expansion in government spending that has come from trying to deal with the economic fallout of the pandemic. Um, and I really look forward to being able to um, write and report on uh, the ways in which yeah, the um, Big Brother is growing during this crisis. Um, I'm very thankful for uh, the Fund for American Studies for having me as a fellow. Um, and yep, that's it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. I'm delighted to be the inaugural recipient of the John Farley Fellowship. I look forward to pursuing this project and all the research, reporting, and writing it entails in John's honor. As we all know, Pennsylvania, with its 20 electoral college votes, played the pivotal role in the presidential election. In 2016, the state, especially its historically democratic working class regions, delivered for Donald Trump. In 2020, we saw how a suburban revolt at once Republican strongholds, combined with better margins in working class regions, fueled Joe Biden's state level victory. But in either case, Trump in 2016 or Biden this month, Pennsylvanians didn't feel wide winning margins. It's a tribute to Pennsylvania's cultural complexity and mercurial voting patterns. In 1986, Jim Carville famously described Pennsylvania as Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Alabama in the middle. That portrayal wasn't the case then, and it's certainly not true today. In reality, Pennsylvania is a state of culturally fractious regions, each one shaped by history, culture, and even geology. These regions can deliver surprising results and complicate the state's electoral map for both parties. In 2016, it was one county, Luzerne in the Northeast Anthracite Coal region, that delivered 60% of Trump's winning margin statewide. Even this year, as suburbs favored Biden at the top, Republicans enjoyed widespread success in down ballot races, including in places like suburban Philadelphia. My project will explore Pennsylvania's political realignment, which won't end with this election. The Keystone State will continue to play an outsized role in U.S. politics. And it's so, it's so my mission for everyone, from reporters to general readers, to have better understanding of a state undergoing cultural, economic, and demographic change. I'll examine overlooked trends in noteworthy regions. How will the continued population exodus from Metro, Metro New York, for example, affect the politics of nearby regions like the Poconos and the Lehigh Valley? And could the Harrisburg and Lancaster regions, both Republican-leaning areas which continue to grow, trend Democrat long-term? As a lifelong Pennsylvanian, I'll explore what is happening at the local level and what it means for the state's political future. This will be especially important leading up to the 2022 midterms, when the state will have an open Senate and governor's race. I look forward to sharing my findings, which I hope could become the basis for a book. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Dan. Thanks to the Fund for American Studies. Thanks also to Rusty Reno and Sora Bamari for their support. 
In the summer of 2017, I reviewed for First Things a dreadful book purporting to show that George Cardinal Pell of Australia was a sex criminal. The review appeared shortly after Pell's formal charging with multiple sexual offenses against minors. Australia rejoiced in Pell's eventual conviction, though the trial produced no corroboration of the allegations, indeed contradicted them with plain facts and unchallenged witnesses. In April this year, the conviction was overturned, very deservedly, by a unanimous decision of Australia's high court to much wailing and gnashing of teeth. The whole saga caused me to marvel, not for the first time, at the eagerness of the public to be scandalized, to believe in what we all profess to want to disbelieve, even when, as in this case, it is actually unbelievable. I think this happens in part because scandals address our need for moral clarity. It's tempting to say that a society that honored the virtue of chastity would not need to fantasize about Cardinal Pell. Scandals force people to take sides. They make silence on the matter at hand impossible. They compel the public articulation of norms. Often they compel the forging of new norms. Various sex scandals of the past 10 years have allowed us to affirm that despite the sexual revolution, there are norms governing relations between adults consent or affirmative consent or enthusiastic consent, provided neither partner enjoys racial or professional privilege or plays lacrosse or pledged a frat. In other words, recent sex scandals have revised our norms leftward, codifying the stringency of the woke. It doesn't need to go this way. As recently as the 1980s and 90s, the craze for recovering memories of childhood sexual trauma supported both conservative and liberal polemics. The right could focus on daycare centers, the left on the family, in firming up minimal norms. The fact that recovered memory therapy led to false memories and wrongful convictions is now widely acknowledged and deplored, except in woke quarters where it is often downplayed or denied. The two most iconic Me Too cases, Weinstein and Kavanaugh, each elicited debates about traumatic memory and insistence that such memories, often repressed, are always indelible. The return of recovered memory to vogue and prestige among the woke exemplifies for me the usefulness of scandal. In professing a scandal, you gain moral authority such as you would need in order to reset moral norms for everybody. My Novak project looks at recent scandals, especially those I think were decided wrongly in whole or in part in the court of public opinion or in courts of law, because determinations of guilt or innocence are of great concern for those affected, and because the weaponization of scandal in our culture wars should be of concern to everyone. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dimitri Symes Jr. And I'm originally from the Washington DC area, but I'm currently based in Moscow, Russia, where I cover Russian foreign policy, along with developments in Ukraine and Belarus. My Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Project looks at the emerging partnership between Russia and China and its national security implications for the United States. Over the past several years, we have seen Russia and China expand their cooperation in ways that were considered unthinkable just a decade ago. Just to name a few examples, the two countries now hold regular joint military exercises. They have also signed a $400 billion gas deal, and they have even managed to dramatically reduce their reliance on the dollar. Just last month, Russian Vladimir, President Vladimir Putin went so far as to suggest that the two countries may at some point in the near future form a military alliance. And indeed, a growing number of experts consider them to already be de facto allies. What does this mean for the United States? To be honest, it's not quite clear. On one hand, the two countries have a history of tensions and the power gap between them is increasing. There most definitely is a potential for distrust and tension. But at the same time, they have moved farther and faster than anyone thought was possible. The aim of my project will be to explain to the American public why Russia and China are drawing closer together, the areas in which they are cooperating, and what all of this means for the United States. 
Thank you all, and I look forward to sharing the results of my project with you. Hi, my name is Tara Isabella Burden, and my project is called Miniature Gods, Why We Cannot Create Ourselves and Why We Keep Trying Anyway. And the work I do on this project will go towards a book on the history of the idea of uh, self-making more broadly, uh, and in particular, the contemporary personal brand, the persona you might use, uh, for example, on social media, or in the service of trying to get a job, or even on a dating site, the creation of yourself as a commodity to advertise and share with others. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of self-making. Uh, we can think, for example, about the self-made man, the kind of uh, American idea of the person who creates himself and uh, creates his success through sheer force of will. We can think too about the uh, the dandy, a figure that we find uh, historically, particularly from the 19th century onward, as someone who creates their life as a work of art. Uh, and we can think of self-making in terms of um, modern celebrity culture and the ways in which people might, for example, manipulate or uh, work with or in dialogue with uh, the media to create a kind of public identity. And also we can think about this politically, um, sort of the vision of particularly the populist statesman, someone like historically Gabriele D'Annunzio, who, um, whose act of self-creation is also a, a kind of political call to arms. So my project will have two parts. Um, there will be historical approach, looking at self-making as a quintessentially modern idea from Renaissance humanism to uh, political liberalism and sort of Locke's ideas of self-cultivation. Um, and also looking at the rise of um, the kind of modern celebrity culture, as you might find um, sort of from the 19th century and the birth of modern media uh, onwards. The second part of my uh, project will look at the contemporary ways in which uh, self-making manifests today. Um, the gig economy, for example, uh, online dating sites and the way that we create ourselves for that, the um, idea of the influencer economy and sponsored content and the idea that we can use our lives on social media to sell things. So I want to look both historically and uh, in, from a sort of contemporary lens at what it means to create ourself and look at some of the uh, freedoms this might offer us, but also some of the drawbacks of thinking of ourselves as mere uh, commodities to be perfected and sold. Hi, I'm Lyman Stone. My project is about family. It's about childbearing, it's about child rearing, it's about parenting, it's about governments, and it's about fertility rates. Around the world, fertility rates are falling. In developed countries, of course, rich countries, people tend to have smaller families, but also in developing countries, birth rates are falling faster and to lower levels than we've ever seen before. And governments are noticing. Now, in some countries, governments are responding in ways that are perfectly consistent with ideas of liberty and individual rights. They're just providing resources to families to help them achieve their reasonable family aspirations. They're just trying to make it possible for people to have families uh, in a world that's increasingly inhospitable to family formation. But in other countries, that's not the case. Governments are engaging in highly interventionist policies that treat fertility rates not as a product of individual flourishing and expression of aspirations, but just another thing for central planners to target, to reach it however they may. These policies that don't necessarily always square with our ideas of individual liberty are worth inspecting further. So my project looks at how people experience family policy, comparing across countries, different circumstances in the US. I look at whether these policies are successful in the eyes of the policymakers who implemented them or by external and objective standards looking at their intended goals, but also by looking at how people experience these policies. Do they see them as actually helping them achieve their goals? Or do they see it as a kind of creepy intervention by the state trying to regulate their family life? Of course, there's differences in different places, and those differences are something I'm interested in exploring more. But on a larger level, my project is exploring where individual liberties and ideas of individual rights fit into a world where governments are increasingly preoccupied 
with a basically collective question about population. Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us here in, at the National Press Club, and thank you for joining us online. I'm Roger Ream, president of the Fund for American Studies, and uh, it's always a wonderful night when we present our Robert Novak Journalism Fellows and our Joseph Rago Fellow for Excellence in Journalism. Uh, I first want to congratulate all our Novak Journalism Fellows. Uh, we have high expectations for all of you, but we have complete confidence in your ability that you won't disappoint us. Your predecessors have produced, at last count, more than 75 books as a result of their Novak fellowships. And many more uh, have been published by our Novak fellows in subsequent years. Uh, they produced uh, reams and reams of uh, column inches of uh, reporting, thanks to the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program. One of our fellows even won a Pulitzer Prize, I like to say at a time when that was still a pre prestigious award to win. On behalf of the Fund for American Studies, thanks to all who support the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship and the Joseph Rago Fellowship. I particularly want to thank Julie Smith and her colleagues at the Smith Family Foundation, including the late Don Smith, for their generous support each year in underwriting uh, this event and this program. Uh, we are grateful to you, Julie, and to all at the Smith Family Foundation. Well, thanks to all who support uh, these great programs. These programs have a special place at the Fund for American Studies, and in my heart as well, both because they, these programs really stand on the shoulders of giants. Great journalists like Robert Novak and Joseph Rago, our longtime program director, who Dan mentioned, John Farley, and Tom Phillips, the benefactor who established the Novak Fellowships. Tonight, I have the honor of presenting the 2020 Thomas L. Phillips Career Achievement Award. Tom Phillips was a longtime member of the Board of Trustees of the Fund for American Studies and the inspiration for us establishing, for these fellowships being established. It was through his support and counsel from his good friend Bob Novak that the fellowships came into existence. Tom had a distinguished career in journalism as the publisher of newsletters, books, and magazines. When he turned over responsibility for the Novak fellowships to the Fund for American Studies in 2013, and retired to California, my one condition was that he allow us to create the Career Achievement Award, recognizing his commitment to honest, ethical, and objective journalism. I spoke with Tom yesterday from his home in California. He expressed his delight, Maria, that you've been selected to receive this award in his name. He's grateful to all who support the Robert Novak Fellowship Program and the Joseph Rago Fellowships. He understands their importance. I certainly don't need to say much to justify why we have selected Maria Bartiromo to receive an award that is dedicated to honest, ethical, and objective journalism. At heart, she is a reporter. She has devoted her career to getting the hard facts, the hard to find information that her audience wants to have, information that more often than not cannot be found elsewhere. Maria Bartiromo is anchor and global markets editor at the Fox Business Network and Fox News Channel. She is the anchor of Mornings with Maria on Fox Business and also anchors Sunday Morning Futures on Fox News, the most watched Sunday morning program on cable television. Maria has been a pioneer in her industry. In 1995, she became the first journalist to report live from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on a daily basis. She has covered business and the economy for more than 30 years, 
and was one of the building blocks of the business cable network CNBC. She's received two Emmys, a Gracie Award for Greenspan, Power, Money, and the American Dream. In 2009, the Financial Times named Bartiromo one of the 50 faces that shaped the decade. She was the first female journalist inducted into the Cable Hall of Fame, and she's moderated three presidential debates. On October 27th of this year, Threshold Editions, an imprint of Simon & Schuster, published the book, The Cost, Trump, China, and the American Revival, co-written with James Freeman of the Wall Street Journal. Before we hear from Maria, I'm pleased to introduce Tom Phillips' son, Parker Phillips, who will express his and his father's thoughts about our award presentation. Ms. Bartiromo, on behalf of my father, Tom Phillips, for whom this award is named and who founded the entire fellowship program in 1994, we congratulate you. Your career is extremely impressive. And one of the things my father loves about you and your many achievements is that they exemplify excellence across many different types of media. From your column, obviously your illustrious television career, to writing books and using your platform to teach others. Now, I understand you're a little bit Italian, and in particular, that you have some Sicilian in you. Something you may not know with a name like Phillips is that my father also has some Sicilian in him. So, on behalf of the entire Phillips family, and most especially my dad, congratulazioni and brava. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for this special recognition. This award is just beautiful, and I want you to know how grateful I am for this. Thank you to Paul Jago and to Roger and Marie uh, and the Fund for American Studies. Congratulations to this year's Robert Novak Journalism Fellows. I am so privileged to be with you today, particularly now at this moment in time when journalism seems to be at a crossroads and freedom of the press is being curtailed. Objectivity and fairness have come second to opinions and ideologies, and censorship is happening in front of our eyes, if you can believe it or not. I am grateful to receive the Thomas L. Phillips Career Achievement Award. A Career Achievement Award suggests to me some kind of finality in your career, but actually, I'm not feeling any finality at all because I am busier than ever with three shows, 17 and a half hours of programming every week as I try hard to seek truth and honor journalism to its fullest. I've been so blessed to have had a front row seat on several incredible cycles of our economy throughout my career. From the individual investor empowerment boom back in 1988 and 89, to globalization, to a boom and then a bust in the 1990s uh, of the internet, a housing boom and a housing bust, and the worst recession in a generation in the 2000s and 2006, not to mention 9-11, the presidential elections and administrations of George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, all the while, I have tried hard to seek out truth and help viewers understand the issues of the day clearly. I started my career after a stint in radio at CNN during the glory days for CNN. This is not the CNN of today. This would Ted Turner CNN. And as a young production assistant, I learned how to cover a story as it was actually happening. I remember as a PA in the CNN newsroom watching Bernard Shaw on the TV screen under the bed in Baghdad, telling us about the first Gulf War, telling us about bombs as they were going off. It was something incredible, something different. Nobody was doing what Ted Turner CNN was doing, telling you a story as it was happening, rather than waiting until 6.30 at night to bring you the news. It served me well a few years later when I became uh, and arrived at the New York Stock Exchange to become the first person to broadcast live during the trading day from the trading floor. In retrospect, I have been honored to help democratize information, to help investors decipher what is most important to their money 
and help put them on the same playing field as institutions by reporting every morning market moving calls and ensuring that I was calling the big players to report to the small players, make sure the small investor was armed with the right information to best compete. For 20 years, I worked at CNBC, and I know we made a difference in educating the public about important money and economic issues. I am equally so proud of my work at Fox News and Fox Business. I have been here now seven years, and once again, I've been able to follow some very important stories very closely and honestly. Journalism is about being true to the story. It means you must follow the story wherever it takes you. It means not judging where it might go. It means if you make a mistake, you correct it and you get back on track. You learn from it. You keep following it. I've done that here at, Stop, at Fox, keeping stories alive to get to the bottom of them. Stories are living organisms. They change. You don't know the answer. You don't know where it's going. You don't know how it will end. You stay with it. You chip away at the truth. You have to work at it. And you have to know who to trust. I'm trying to ask the questions I think my audience wants asked every day and use all of my abilities to seek out honesty and truth. A free press and journalism are critical to our confusing world. Done well, it can change the world. It can educate and lift people out of poverty, lift people's lives with truth and knowledge. Done poorly, and it's just entertainment. True journalism and a free press are foundational to our democracy. It is one of the best things about our great country. It is the best thing about what I do. I'm honored to be able to do this every day, and I want you to know how grateful I am to be recognized for it. I will cherish this honor. I will keep working hard. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria, very much. Uh, we're honored to present the award to you this evening and particularly appreciate your remarks. Uh, as you said, uh, a free press, good journalism are foundational to a free country. And we have to always keep that foremost in our minds. Uh, and that is why the work Marie Bartiromo does is so important, why the work of our Novak Fellows is vital, and why our Joseph Rago program is so important. We are honored that the Rago family came to us after Joe's untimely death, uh, that we could help and work with them to ensure that this program would carry on Joe's legacy uh, in future years. We've seen that through our first two Rago Fellows, Elliot Kaufman and Matthew King, and we are seeing it now with our third fellow, Alexandra Boki, who you'll be meeting shortly. But I just wanna, we will now be hearing from Paul Rago, who will be speaking on behalf of his wife, Nancy, uh, their son and daughter, Adam and Grace, and their entire family about the importance of this fellowship program. Uh, we encourage you all to support it generously so we can keep Joe Rago's legacy living through this outstanding program. Here's Paul Rago. Good evening and welcome to all. On behalf of the Rago family, let me begin by thanking all of you for participating in this virtual dinner tonight. Your generosity has made the outstanding accomplishments of the Novak and Rago Fellows possible. By creating these opportunities, we are investing in our future. My congratulations to the Novak Fellows, our newest Rago Fellow, whom I will introduce in a moment, and especially to Maria Bartiromo for receiving the Phillips Award. My only regret is that we won't have the opportunity to meet in person. My thanks extend also to Roger Ream and Dan McCarthy at TFAS, and to Paul Jago and the entire family at the Wall Street Journal and News Corp. The pandemic, the economy, our society, and of course the election are all sources of great anxiety. At times we are fearful of how everything will work out. Can we make it? How will our country look in the future? These concerns are not new. They were there at our founding. In April, 1776, John Adams wrote to his friend, Mercy Otis Warren, 
I sometimes tremble to think that although we are engaged in the best cause that ever employed the human heart, yet the prospect for success is doubtful, not for one of power or of wisdom, but of virtue. We are engaged in the best cause that ever employed the human heart. Think about it. Strength and wisdom are important, but without virtue, neither you or our country will succeed. Virtue, like beauty, is in part in the eye of the beholder. Now, in some ways, Joe might find my emphasis on virtue somewhat humorous. In 2007, Joe wrote a parody of Veblen's Conspicuous Consumption in an article entitled Conspicuous Virtue. He commented on the humor of such things as the sustainable sofa or eating a burger without having to worry about what happened to the cow. Joe was ahead of the curve. Almost a decade before the term virtue signaling was coined, Joe had identified a central feature of modern society. Conspicuous virtue is an oxymoron because its declaration negates the underlying premise. I like to think, in fact, I know, that Joe valued inconspicuous virtue, the kind you don't flaunt, but everyone knows you have. Those virtues that play out in how you conduct your life, how you work, and how you love your family, friends, and yes, even those you don't like. We hope that the Rego Fellowship can highlight the need for inconspicuous virtue in journalism. Our previous awardees, Elliot Kaufman and Matthew Taylor King, certainly possessed it in abundance. Our current fellow, Alessandra Bakke, has it in equal measure. We are so very pleased to introduce Alessandra as our newest Joseph Rago Fellow at the Wall Street Journal. She has a sense of adventure and has written many stories about Europe and Northern Africa. She has demonstrated an extraordinary ability to write about the role of religion in society and a willingness to take difficult but principled stands on controversial topics. From that perspective, I'm sure Joe would approve. All would agree that we face challenging time in our history, but history is a sequence of challenging times one right after the other. And our ability to meet the next challenge is proportional to our knowledge of the previous ones. That is why the Fund for American Studies is so important. Journalists get to write the first draft of history, but we all participate in shaping it. In the grand experiment we call America, we are, as John Adams put it so well, engaged in the best cause that ever employed the human heart. I know you, I know we are up for the task. So with no further ado, I introduce to you, Alessandra Bakke. Thank you. It's truly an honor to be here. First, I must thank Mr. and Mrs. Rago for giving me the opportunity to do my part to carry on Joseph Rago's legacy. By working for the Wall Street Journal opinion page, Paul and Nancy, I will do my very best to honor Joe's memory with this incredible opportunity. While following Joe's work and reading about his life, I was incredibly inspired by uh, his work and by his character. I definitely have big shoes to fill. One of Joe's opinion pieces particularly resonated with me. In 2006, when the internet had just started redefining our media landscape, Joe already understood how this could affect the quality of journalism. In a piece titled The Blog Mob, he wrote, quote, the bloggers, for their parts, produce minimal reportage. Instead, they ride along with the mainstream media like we're more a fish on the bellies of sharks, picking at the scrap. Most of them are pretty awful. 
Many, even some with large followings, are downright appalling. <laughs> if only Joe knew what that culture had become today. Blogs, alternative channels, and social media personalities are attempting to replace the media's role in society and the standards and values that created it. When I finished university, there were easier ways I could have had my voice heard online outside traditional journalism. But I always believed I needed to put in the work and have the humility to understand I had to learn about an issue before I could express my opinion. This is why in 2016, when we were experiencing, I would say, turbulent times in Europe, uh, as my first job, I decided to leave Italy, my home country, and work as a journalist in a newspaper in North Africa. It was small and unglamorous, and quite removed from an institution like the Wall Street Journal. At the time, I could only have dreamed to be standing here tonight. When I saw Joe, I found everything about what I respect in journalism, a commitment to truth, an intellectual integrity, and the courage to go against the crowd. He therefore is and will remain a point of reference for me and countless journalists to pursue this profession. When people ask me for advice on how to start out in journalism, I can only point to Joe as one of our greatest examples. I would also like to thank Paul Gigot, James Saranto, Matthew Hennessy, and my colleagues at the Features team for making me feel so welcome during this very strange time in our history. Even while working remotely, I have already learned so much about the passion, diligence, and commitment that is required to work at this outstanding newspaper. To the Fund for American Studies and the Wall Street Journal opinion page, which gives young journalists and writers the opportunities to thrive in their careers, thank you for choosing me for the Joseph Rago Fellowship for Excellence in Journalism. And now I am honored to introduce the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who, who leads the Wall Street Journal editorial team, our editorial page editor, Paul Gigo. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much uh, Alessandra. Alessandra. Uh, and it is a pleasure uh, to be here with everybody, even if it is from afar and uh, 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 virtual. Uh, can, I assume you can hear me. Can you hear me, Alessandra? Uh, yeah, okay, good. I'm told we tried to uh, book the uh, French Laundry restaurant uh, for this evening, but uh, California Governor uh, Gavin Newsom had it booked uh, ahead of us, so we couldn't do that, so we had to do this virtual meeting instead, but maybe next year. Uh, congratulations to the winners uh, tonight, the Novak Fellows, uh, and their exciting projects. It was great listening to them. Bob Novak was a great friend of mine a man I, whose journalism I, I very much admired. It's great to see his example living on through your work. And it's also great to see Geraldine here uh, as, as well uh, online. Congrats as well to Maria Bartiromo um, getting the Tom Phillips Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, what a remarkable career Maria has had, breaking down barriers in financial journalism. And I think in particular in the last couple of years, she's really made a, a, a very significant contribution by focusing on stories that so many others in the media ignore. She's fearless, smart, and she really does want to get to the truth. And those are qualities that uh, all journalists can aspire to have. Thanks to the Fund for American Studies, uh, our partner with the Rago family uh, on the fellowship. Uh, they really have uh, uh, been great partners in this, in this endeavor. Uh, helping us uh, solicit the uh, terrific candidates we've had uh, and uh, working with us uh, as well on this dinner. So thank you, Dan McCarthy and, and, and Roger Reen. Uh, uh, it's been, uh, uh, and your team, it's been a, a good partnership. And it's especially good to see Nancy and Paul Rago, as well as uh, Adam, Megan, and Grace. Nice to see you again. Sorry we couldn't do this in person. I assure you we will do it again uh, in the future. The Regos came up with this idea uh, uh, after Joe's death for the fellowship, not, not only as a way to honor Joe, but as a way to, to uh, give young people a chance, a chance to follow in Joe's very large footsteps and, uh, and get an opportunity uh, to work at the journal and to uh, uh, 
and to uh, pass, pass on the values that Joe represented. Uh, and the program has, uh, has met, I think, exceeded uh, our expectations at the journal uh, so far in, in just the three years that uh, it's, been, it's been operating. As we've had Elliot Kaufman, who was our first fellow, he now works on our features team as a writer and editor. Matthew King, he, uh, uh, he had, a, I think, a good year with us, certainly we benefited from his presence. And now he went on to, uh, to uh, be uh, Henry Kissinger's uh, assistant, uh, uh, which is not a bad uh, gig. And now Alessandra, uh, uh, who you have met and who is already contributing as a regular member of the, the features team. She had written for us actually before she joined us and has continued to do so. And I have to say, this is not, as she suggested, this is not the easiest year to be a fellow. <laughs> given the fact that the interactions that you normally have in an office setting just aren't there. Uh, but she's participating in all of our calls and on uh, all of our Zoom meetings. And, uh, uh, and she's doing this with good humor and adaptability. And I'm really grateful to her for, for doing that. Uh, you know, Joe uh, Rega was special because uh, of his intellect because of his uh, writing talent, I think, but he was even more impressive for his, uh, for the human qualities he brought uh, uh, to his journalism. He was generous with colleagues. He was generous with sources. He was even generous with subjects. Uh, not all of us in the, in, the, in the industry are. He was curious about the world. He was skeptical of uh, political promises and glib claims. Uh, he saw the humor in the human condition and especially in politics. I remember the time he came to me with an idea for an editorial uh, he had just received a press release from the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, which was not always the, 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 the most uh, uh, sexiest topic, you might say. Um, but it turns out it was about uh, the, they had uh, sanctioned uh, Ivanka Trump's company for the scarves because they were too flammable. And it turns out the scarves have been made in China when of course Ivanka's father was running a campaign against Chinese imports. It could have been a, a simple editorial about uh, double standards, but uh, Joe turned it into a amusing and, uh, and uh, elegant editorial about global supply chains and trade and what he called the trade lesson in Trump scars. And I'll just quote a couple of sentences. Thankfully, no one has been injured by these combustible accessories, Joe wrote. So a question is whether Donald Trump and his family partners will ever be burned by voters for the disjunction between the political, his political rhetoric and business practices. And he gave a short tutorial on why textile production of all things is coming back to the United States. That was Joe, witty, non-dogmatic, thinking for himself, making his arguments in a way that sought to persuade with information, not merely by assertion. As Joe used to say, after I put him in charge of uh, our summer intern program, no one cares what you think. He didn't mean that harshly. He meant that readers want you to, to tell them more than their opinion, your opinion. He wants you to tell them what they don't know. Tell them something they don't know or haven't thought of. And you'll build that credibility so that when you do offer your opinion, uh, it'll have more standing. Uh, I think that's also that's a lesson for all of us this year, which I would submit has not been a great one for uh, American journalism. The press, the press corps once again predicted a landslide election that turned out not to be a landslide, turned out to be very close. With some exceptions, I think the press has done a generally poor job on the pandemic, flogging the case numbers and uh, uh, cheering lockdowns without uh, skepticism or uh, investigation into the costs uh, of, of that. Um, I think this reflects a troubling trend in journalism. And I'll just make this point tonight, this is my last point, which is, I think this trend uh, is worrying is um, the troubling trend on uh, a culture of conformity in, in the press. Uh, increasingly, everyone is supposed to take the same view of a particular event or, uh, or what's been reported, or even what we cover. You're only supposed to cover certain things, not others. 
And dissenters are too often ostracized or disciplined uh, with Twitter assaults or negative articles uh, by so-called press critics. I think the best example uh, I can point to is the Russia collusion narrative, which nearly every media outlet for three years treated like gospel. But I'm proud to say that a couple of people on our team at the journal, Holman Jenkins and Kim Strassel in particular, looked at the evidence and the more they looked, the more implausible that uh, that collusion narrative seemed. And they started to ask questions and they started to dig and they started to, to uh, write columns that weren't popular at first. They took a lot of abuse for it, but in raising doubts, they did a public service because in fact, they turned proved to be correct. Um, and I think they, they, I would nominate them for a poet. I did nominate them for a Pulitzer. Uh, they didn't win, but I will say uh, without uh, uh, any doubt, they deserved it. Um, the, um, uh, I think the problem with this conformity is it causes journalists to ignore truths that might be staring us right, right in front of us, but that we don't see because we can't imagine uh, an alternative point of view. We can't imagine that somebody might look at that and think about it differently. We can't imagine a different interpretation of events. The risk of this is that it leads to enormous mistakes. Uh, obviously the interpretation of the Russia, collu the, the Russia collusion uh, narrative was a, was a terrible uh, uh, misdirection, misallocation of media resources, and ultimately uh, didn't do a great service to the government or the country. But it can also lead to, to uh, consensus uh, uh, that uh, is the wrong kind of consensus, such as that lockdowns are the right pandemic policy, or that the Federal Reserve can uh, buy bonds and keep interest rates as low as uh, at zero for years without ultimately there being a, a, a price to pay. Uh, my old uh, boss and mentor, Bob Bartley, used to say that consensus is the enemy of news. What he meant was that uh, uh, news is something different. It's what you go find that isn't something you expect. It isn't something that, that everybody else thinks. Uh, and uh, I think that's a lesson for, uh, it's certainly a, the way that Joe Rago practiced journalism. Uh, it's certainly the way that the Bob Novak practiced journalism. I hope it is the way that we practice journalism at the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, uh, and I hope that uh, we can impart those kinds of values, that value, that, uh, that instinct to, to Alessandra. So I'll leave it there. And uh, thank you all so much again for coming tonight and for your support for the, for the Rego Fellowship. We really appreciate it. So I have a few questions. The first one is from Christine. Mr. Gigot, what's the hardest call you've ever have to make as an, had to make as an editor? The hardest call? Uh, well, you wanted to start out with the easy questions. Um, <laughs> I, let's, uh, uh, you know, it's, I suppose the hardest one was to support the, uh, uh, the bailout uh, for the banks, the, the putting, using the public balance sheet in 2008 uh, to prevent the uh, meltdown of the financial system. It, was, uh, it, it went against everything that philosophically I... Uh, uh, I would, I would, uh, I, I thought, but uh, the circumstances at the time were such that I felt that had to be done, or else there'd be a larger meltdown. It was a difficult, difficult call, uh, and as uh, my colleagues at the editorial page will uh, will uh, agree, I think uh, there were a few dissenters and uh, quite a bit of uh, of back and forth on that point. Uh, History will determine if we were correct. I think in, all, uh, in the end, it, it was a costly decision politically and economically, but I think uh, the cost would have been higher without it. James asks, Mr. Gigot, is the Democratic Party becoming a socialist party and is the Republican Party up to the task of defending free markets? Uh, <laughs> Is the Democratic Party becoming a socialist party? Well, big chunks of it are. There's no question. Uh, 
I think you're going to see in the Biden administration uh, a rather ferocious uh, uh, extended argument between the left, which is socialist, and which uh, uh, and 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 the more moderate uh, parts of the party that Joe Biden represents, which do have socialist uh, inclinations in their uh, certainly in their policy results, but I don't think they but they're not in the Bernie Sanders uh, camp, so they're going to have a big fight. Um, is the Republican Party up to uh, the task of, of taking it on? I, I would uh, the, defending the free market. I would say that uh, the Republican Party is going to have its own debate and is having its own debate the, uh, uh, about uh, markets and the utility. Uh, you know, uh, there's some people on the right <clears throat> who think that uh, they call market fundamentalism is, uh, is, uh, is misguided. I'm not sure, quite sure what market fundamentalism means. Do they mean <clears throat> that uh, the rules of economics that uh, you can't repeal? Uh, but they do make a very good point, which is with Joe Reg with uh, Paul Rago talked about, which is the virtue and the necessity of virtue as a basis in any culture for a free society. You can't have uh, a really free society unless you have a public that is uh, going to operate with tolerance and restraint and self-discipline and self-responsibility, and uh, and and those values are important too. So. Those are going to be competing interests within the, Dem within the Republican Party, re competing impulses in the coming years. I just hope that the party doesn't throw over uh, the, the, uh, the, the lessons of, uh, of uh, pro-growth economics, which ultimately uh, leads to the prosperity of the most, uh, the most people. It's going to be a big fight leading up from now to 2024, I think. Daniel asks, Mr. Gigo, tonight's program includes many young journalists. What advice do you have for them as they launch their careers in these times of political correctness and a changing media environment? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I tried to give a little uh, uh, a bit in, uh, in my remarks. I think Maria uh, did as well. Um, and so did Paul and so did Alessandra. I mean, I think one is don't uh, don't just fall in with the pack. Think for yourself. Uh, discover for yourself. Report for yourself. One of the reasons I, as a young journalist, wanted to be a reporter for a while is I didn't really feel very confident in my opinions. I didn't feel I had standing. I didn't. You know what? What the hell did I know? <laughs> I mean, all I knew was I were had grown up in what I had what I had had observed. And so I went out to Asia and I was a reporter in Asia and that was a grounding formative experience for me because I got to see free societies versus unfree societies, how people lived, uh, the differences I could, I could deal with. I saw authoritarian governments and people struggling to be free politically and economically. And, and, it, and all of that informed a lot of what I've learned. The other thing I would say is uh, get uh, get uh, become an expert at something, uh, master some master a subject. I don't care what it is. It could be uh, a foreign foreign policy, a foreign beat. It could be uh, the law. It could be economics. It could be as uh, young Mr. Symes, uh, Russia. And it, but become an expert on something, and you'll find that uh, you're very valuable for that expertise and it'll serve you well for across your career. And this is my favorite question from Steve. Is there any hope for a return to the days of Robert, Robert Novak when shoe leather uh, reporting was expected rather than reporters who pontificate without doing the real work? I think we know the point of view of that questioner. <laughs> You know, the one of the reasons I, I, I competed with Bob Novak, I mean, we sat together at the, with Geraldine uh, and Fred Barnes for years at the Wizards uh, uh, games, and we became good friends. But Novak was a competitor because he wrote columns. And I wrote a column at the same time, a political column, and I like to do reporting. But every day I would get up that were my, uh, on a Thursday, I would write Thursday for Friday, and I'd look at Novak's column and say, oh, he just scooped me again. <laughs> and uh, uh, 
And, and that was what Bob was so good at. He was just a tremendous reporter. I don't know if we're ever going to, do I think we'll get back to that? I think people will increasingly put a value on that because, uh, at least I hope they will, because um, it, is, it, it is that fundamental factual basis for, uh, uh, for ideas and, and, and the truth about what is going on that is so important to understand. And one of the, one of the problems that I have with the current moment is uh, we just have uh, so much, uh, there, that we don't operate out of a common set of facts too often and often enough in this democracy. And I think that's, that's troubling. So I hope we get back to Novak uh, style journalism. I don't know. Uh, certainly we try to practice it at the journal as much as we can. Thank you very much. Sorry we didn't get to my question for Paul about how the Packers are going to do in the playoffs, but uh, Paul's from Green Super Bay. Bowl and, uh, Super Bowl bound. He could have given us some insights. His grandfather helped keep the team in Green Bay <laughs> many years ago. But let me just say, this is uh, just an outstanding event every year. Uh, it really is a source of hope and optimism for the future to see these young journalists who aspire to the kinds of standards that both Maria and Paul talked about, that Paul Rago also spoke about, about virtue. And uh, we really are committed at the Fund for American Studies to our mission of producing young people who are courageous, courageous as leaders, courageous as journalists, and can lead us into a bright future. Uh, we recognize that America is an experiment in liberty, and it's up to each generation to make sure that that experiment continues. And just like free speech is a bedrock, a foundational principle of our free society, as Maria said, uh, just like free markets are, uh, it is virtue and freedom that really lead us to our exceptionalism as a country. I want to thank, uh, again, the Smith Family Foundation, Julie Smith, for their support of this program and this dinner. I want to thank uh, Geraldine Novak. Uh, I want to thank all of Paul and Nancy Rago's extended family for their support of the program, as well as uh, friends of Joe's and uh, colleagues of his at the Wall Street Journal, including Paul Jago and Dan Henninger and News Corp and uh, the Wall Street Journal for their generous support of this program and, and their work with us on this partnership. Uh, we give thanks to all those who support the Fund for American Studies as well. Now you're going to have the opportunity, if you so desire, to go into breakouts. You can join Alessandra in the Rego Fellowship Breakout, or you can go into the Novak Fellowship Breakout sessions. You will have received an email very recently, in the last uh, few minutes, indicating the, with the link to uh, the breakouts. You, it's a Zoom link. And it'll take you into these breakouts, and you can choose which session you'd like to join. And our fellows are here at various stations around the room, uh, ready to talk to you, answer questions, uh, and hear from you, or here you can learn more about their projects. So please join us for these Zoom sessions. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good night.